Detroit City Council in chaos. We'll take a look at the very latest, plus the potential impact in Michigan from the Supreme Court's gay marriage decision. Also, the Wayne County Jail Project under the microscope. And could a write-in campaign really work? It's all coming up right now on My Week. Michigan's turnaround is being powered by things we do better than anywhere else in the world. Today's global leaders routinely turn to Michigan to work on their most difficult problems. That's because the engineering talent in this part of the world is simply the best. So many possibilities lie ahead for Michigan's future. These opportunities are here and starting to happen. The vision for the new Michigan. Share it, talk it up, drive it home. A route map shows you where we go, but not how we get there. Because in this business, there are no straight lines, only the twists and turns of an unpredictable industry. So the 80,000 employees at Delta must anticipate the unexpected and never let the rules overrule common sense. This is how we tame the unwieldiness of air travel until it's not just lines you see, it's the world. Detroit politics couldn't get any stranger. This week proved we haven't seen it all. The Detroit City Council in chaos. President Charles Pugh wanting a medical leave was turned down by emergency manager Kevin Orr, who moved to strip Pugh of salary and responsibilities. At the same time, a scandal explodes around Pugh and a teen student he mentored. And if that wasn't enough instability, President Pro Tem Gary Brown resigned this week to take a job in Orr's office. Where does this leave council? And more importantly, the people they're supposed to represent. And welcome to my week at the end of yet another packed news week. I'm Christy McDonald. Let's get started with our contributors and the editorial page editors of the Detroit News and Detroit Free Press, Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson. Gentlemen, so last week it was a very busy news week, and Nolan said, you know, that means next week it'll be slow. That's right. And Hold um, you jinxed us. Clearly, it. clearly it was wrong. Well, that's not unusual. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, you know, we said it in the beginning of the show, you think that you've seen it all, but the situation that is now surrounding Charles Pugh, the president of the Detroit City Council, and the fact that he is, is truly missing and hasn't shown and, up for work. We really should run a number across our screen. If you see Charles Pugh, <laughs> call us at 888-whatever. I mean, this is the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. You've got a, the city council president playing Greta Garbo out here. You know, I, I don't want to be public. I don't. He's a politician. He's, he's an elected official. He became a public man when he ran for office, and now he's hiding instead of stepping up and saying and addressing these very serious allegations against him and telling us whether he's going to continue on the council or not continue on the council. And we do tape the show a little bit early on Friday, so again, things could, could happen a little today. bit during the day. But Stephen, what was your what was your thought as this was all kind of unfolding this week? Well, again, where is the council president? I mean, I think you have a responsibility to answer these kind of charges. I think uh, you also have a responsibility to Kevin Orr, um, who was being a little aggressive, I think, in, in deciding that, that somehow he's just going to stop paying uh, uh, Pew because he wants this medical leave. I mean, maybe we ought to wait to find out what the facts are and, and what's really going on before we make that kind of decision. But, but really, the onus falls on, on Pew at this point to come out and say, here's what's going on with me. I'm either going to you know, take a leave to try to deal with this stuff and then come back, or I'm just going to resign. And that's either either of those choices is an honorable one. It's not honorable to just let it happen and 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 disappear. You got some very serious charges out here. You've got a mother who says he was inappropriate with her son, her teenage son, when he was a minor. Uh, when you're in the public eye, when you have a public job, you have to step up and say as. You have to address those those allegations. You have to tell the people who elected you whether or not there's any any truth behind them or how you're going to deal with this situation. Do you think Kevin Orr has dealt with this situation correctly? Yeah, no choice. You can't pay a guy who doesn't show up to work. That's you know that sort of mentality in Detroit that um, okay we're here the people are paying us we've got this job we can do whatever we please that's going to end and and I think he's sending a very good message here, here that no matter here who you are you're not going to get paid with taxpayer dollars scarce taxpayer dollars for not showing up to work. So let's look at the larger picture of Detroit City Council right now 
now. Where does this leave them, especially now that you've got Gary Brown, who left, who resigned this week and is going to be working for Kevin Orr? Yeah, well, I mean, you could, you could very quickly have three empty seats uh, on a nine-member council, which I think, uh, you know, suggests, again, that uh, it's not a very serious body uh, and that, that it's not functioning, which I think is a very dangerous message to send. I think you want to make sure you fill those seats, uh, show people that, that representative democracy still means something, even when there is an emergency manager. It will mean something for sure when Kevin Orr and everyone else packs up and leaves. Uh, we go back to elected uh, governance in the city, but but it's it, it's it's courting a kind of uh, constitutional crisis that you just don't need at the same time that you have all this other stuff going on in the city. You need the council to be intact. You need it to play whatever role Kevin Orr decides it should play, uh, and and do that uh, honorably. That they, they can't. Steve, they can't appoint replacement members at this point. And in terms of representative democracy, everybody knows that's a pretense now. Uh, under the yeah, I well, agree with that. manager, but you can't have the council going in and saying, "Well, we're going to appoint this person and this person, and this person who may be on the fall ballot." Well, they and can't put appoint people on the ballot. Well, that's crazy. Stop them from doing it. Well, I mean, there's the, no there's no rules governing this thing. And if they did that and gave somebody an advantage going yeah, into well, that would the fall, be wrong too. Well, I think that's what they're talking about too. You know, but I think it's also very upsetting for people for Detroiters who maybe those people on council are their only touchstones and they, you know, Kevin Orr has taken over that they feel that they could still call Gary Brown's office, they could still call Charles Pugh's office and feel that they could at least give their opinion whether how much of that and can that was actually the follow through. justification for keeping them in place. But <laughs> now you've had you had Kwame can you, you ought to disappear for 4 months. Now you got Charles Pugh disappearing for 2 and 3 weeks. If you're going to make that argument and if you're going to continue to collect the paycheck and hold the position and defend the position you got to show up. I, I, obviously, and I don't think anyone's going to argue with that, but so how, what do Detroiters do at this point when they see that their council, I mean, you're living in the city of Detroit, what do you think about this? Well, I mean, I, again, I think it's a very dangerous message to send, the, the, the idea that somehow emergency management completely displaces the elected governance of the city. And this is what, this is what feeds the you know, the, the, what I think are the wrong-headed conspiracy uh, theories about what this is really about and, and where we're headed. Uh, it's hard to defend what's going on when you see the political infrastructure crumble the way that, that, that it is and if nobody does anything to, to shore it back up. Okay, so do you think that there are going to be other members that are going to leave? Do other members on the council look at this and say, well, why am I still hanging around here? Well, you've got other members on the council who aren't running for re-election in the fall and who may decide that if a job comes up that rather than wait till January, it's a good time to get a head start on their post political career. But there you again, think? you know, think about that. Think about what that means. These are people who ran four years ago uh, uh, agreed to serve for four years. Uh, anybody else who just said, well, you know, those last six months, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to uh, go off and do something else. We'd vilify him. Uh, that's irresponsible. You were elected to this job to do it for a, 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 a certain amount of time. You got to do it. So do you agree with Gary Brown's decision to go work for Kevin Orr? I, not, not really. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm a big fan of, of, of Gary Brown's is, and I have been since before he was in, uh, on the council. Uh, a, I'm not sure what qualifies him as an executive turnaround uh, person, which is really what the job is that he's being asked to do. There's there's nothing in his background that suggests that he can do that, and and talking about it from the council table doesn't really recommend him for it uh, in my in my mind. Uh, I also think it's again <clears throat> dangerous to be plucking people out of the political infrastructure where they need to be uh, to to show that that's still intact and putting them in the the, the ranks of the emergency managers administration, but then there, you also got the salary issue here. Uh, $225,000 a year for this job when Kevin Orr, every other word out of Kevin Orr's mouth is about how broke we are. Uh, these are, there's some inconsistencies here that again lend themselves to the, to the, the questions about what are you guys really doing uh, and, and does it make a lot of sense. Do you agree? No, of course not. Gary Brown was of the course brightest not. guy um, on that council. Well, but what's that saying? City government. He understands the city, he's been around the city a long time. Time. That brings Kevin Orr an advantage that um, he doesn't have himself. He understands politics and and can can navigate some of the political 
hoops, but he also understands how the city works and where he, he's made a point during his time on council to figure out where the waste is and what's not working. And I think he brings Kevin Orr that experience and some very good solutions. And if he can save some time and money in this process, he's worth every dime. And I understand um, they're going to boot Chris Andrews, so they're going to save that salary. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's a matter of, of, of his salary or, or you know, what it looks like in terms of the council. It's about getting things done. And this move helps Kevin Orr get things done much more efficiently. So doesn't Gary Brown have those intangibles that he knows the landscape and isn't that maybe more important? You know, I've had a lot of conversations with Gary that suggest he does understand how broken the city government is and he's got good ideas for uh, fixing them. There's a big leap though from being able to sit and talk. I mean, I can sit and talk about it. Uh, does that qualify me to be the turnaround guy? But he's not the turnaround guy. Kevin yes, Orr is. is the turnaround guy. He is now helping Kevin Orr with the turnaround and identifying the things that need turning around a big part of that. Last but if, words, if that's Steven. all he was doing, there's 18 reports sitting downtown right now that tell him that you don't need a person that you're paying almost a quarter million dollars a year to help you. But do remember, that. he's replacing somebody. This is not a new Understood. position. All right. Well, let's move on. You know, just when you thought Mike Duggan was off the ballot for Detroit mayor this week, he's now actually considering a write in campaign. So, Nolan, uh, tell us, do you think this is going to be a successful one? I don't know. That's a long shot, but he has um, decided that that's something he wants to try. He told me this morning that you know it wasn't in his mind when he decided not to pursue this to the his case to the Supreme Court uh, when they booted him off the ballot. Uh, he said you know he, he got so much uh, encouragement, so much pressure, particularly from the business community, promise of funds and what have you that. Uh, you know, he just sort of felt that it was something he had to do. I think it's going to be as any writing candidate, as we saw last year Man in the 11th <laughs> Congressional District, that it's not easy um, to get voters to remember to come into the polls and write your name in. Now, this is a much higher uh, profile case. It worked up in Alaska with Lisa Murkowski. I don't know. It's going to, he, you know, he said it's probably going to cost him about $100,000, and he's going to need to get 15 to 20,000 people to write his name in to grab that second spot on the fall ballot. It's a, a big challenge. Do you think it's going to take that amount of money, and do you think money alone is, is going to be able to get him over I that? think it's not money, it's organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually think this gives Duggan uh, maybe a better shot. He probably needs less here than he would have needed uh, if he'd been on the ballot uh, with the others. I mean, the, the, the threshold for, for getting a write-in write candidate, I mean, at least now he's got a firm number that uh, that he can target and say, if I can get to this number of votes, then, then I know I'm I'm good. Uh, uh, I, I'm still, you know, always skeptical of the idea of a write-in. I think yeah. it's difficult to convince people to do it. There's always the questions about, you know, uh, spelling your name, and I don't know what the law says on that. Well, yeah, the law who, says, I who mean, decides it, who well, what the what the voters' the intent was if it. they. Put that, down. And that would be the clerk and yeah. the election commission. But you don't have to spell it exactly right. It is right. intent. So if I say Dugan instead of Duggan, is that the... Uh, yeah. or, or, you know, you, you've got to say something close. Yeah, but, right. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, the, Markowski used the wristbands uh, so that voters remembered right. and you right. could do something like... What you can't do is use stickers, which would have been right. a very efficient way of getting it done. But the stickers apparently jam the uh, counting machines. But Steve's right. I mean, he, now he doesn't have to run really a citywide campaign. Yeah. He's just got to he identify 15 voters. to 20,000 of his voters and make sure he gets them to the polls right. and when they get there they know what to do. Do you think that anything came into his decision, you know, some of the news this week about Benny Napoleon and possible contracts that people are looking at with the, with Wayne County system that he senses some kind of vulnerability there? Well, there's vulnerability up and down the ballot in, in the mayor's race. I mean, this is the weakest field uh, you can imagine. And so, uh, again, I, th I always thought that Duggan, uh, despite the, the, the various drawbacks with his candidacy, was, was the strongest uh, person in that field to begin with. So, I, you, know, I, you know, I don't think he had to spend too much time assessing whether there was weakness uh, that he could take advantage of. It's all over the place. Uh, the question is whether you can target it's a very different kind of campaign than, than a general campaign. Uh, a write-in campaign is, is about and different He things. says that the business community has promised them, him the money, and it was the business community, the business leaders, who pushed him to do it. I talked to the Napoleon campaign this week. They claim that since Duggan dropped out, their contributions have doubled. I mean, they, they picked up a couple hundred grand after Duggan dropped out from the business community. So 
you know, who knows what, what's going on here, but it will be expensive and it, and it is by any measure a long shot. You know, Stephen, you were concerned that, that Duggan would still, because he had to fight his way on the ballot and he ended up losing, that that would be something that would follow him around and would be a detriment to his campaign. Now with a write-in, do you think that that still is true? I think it's, I mean, I think it's the damage from, from what was done to him is, is still there. And, and he is seen now, I think, by far more people than before as the outsider, the guy who, who's, you know, moved into the city and wants to, wants to take over. And that's, that's a very hard perception to, to overcome. That will make the write-in campaign uh, tougher because I think... But if he pulls uh, it off, there's something heroic uh, about absolutely. that. Absolutely. If he gets on the fall ballot, the yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see over the next uh, couple of weeks. Well, you know, the Wayne County Jail Project continues to be a massive problem for County Exec Bob Facano, though he says there's been interest from international investors for the property where the project has been halted. County auditors are now looking at the finances. All right, Nolan, where are we with well, all a, of this? That's just a crock of garbage. I mean, that's more <laughs> Facano spin. There's not interest in that property, if not for the price he thinks he's going to get it. <laughs> Bob Facano has wasted $120 million on this jail, and he's looking for somebody to come along and give him $120 million for property that's worth half of that at most and maybe a quarter of that amount. He was looking for somebody to bail him out so he could do what he should have done in the first place and then it is take that complex along with the courts over to the abandoned Mound Road prison, join the city of Detroit lockup over there and get the whole mess and all those orange jumpsuits out of downtown Detroit. This, this business about international investors. If he's got them, he should put their name on the table. He's trying to whipsaw Dan Gilbert, who he thought was going to write him a check. And Gilbert says, you know, I may buy the property, but I'm not going to wipe away your, the, your political embarrassment here by paying more than it's worth. This is just a despicable mess. Despicable mess? Well, I mean, I think that, well, for starters, there's a reason that, that we're not building the jail over at Mound Road to begin with, which is that uh, this is not just uh, the jail, but this was going to be uh, the, the sort of central lockup for all of Wayne County. And so you want to get rid of jails uh, in, in some other communities and, and concentrate them in one place. Well, you needed to do that someplace where you have access to a lot of freeways. Uh, that's why the site that, they, uh, that they're on was, was, was one that they were thinking about. And uh, the other site that they really thought about was the old Tiger Stadium site, which would also have been a disaster. I'm not saying that you want jails in those places, but for what they're trying to do, you need a certain kind of location, which Mound Road didn't fit. Now, that doesn't excuse the fact that they've blown $120 million. It's where they're, it's where they're going to end up, and they're uh, going to make it fit. I mean, we'll you see. don't... It may not, it may not what, think serve Think of other that cities that. and whether they have jails in the heart of their downtown. Well, sure, go. I mean... This is another Turkey uh, Mullen you know, stinky mess. I mean, you you get to the bottom of this and you've got the same sort of bad decision making and cronyistic deals that led to the county losing $26 million at Pinnacle Racecourse, $27 million at the Guardian Building, um, and, and nobody is there's really no, talking there's about no, it. There's no argument that they screwed it up. I'm saying that the decision, the citing decision, was was not about corruption. That was that was I, about. You can't say that with any confidence. At I, this think, point. I think I think Mound that was, Road is going to work for the city of Detroit. The state offered them a plan that will allow them to take the courts. It will work for the for the jail. It will not work to absorb populations of these other jails because it's just a, it's just an inconvenient location. That's and I want to know wasn't well, where was all this heated discussion back when the decision was made? Well, well that's the point. It, it was the, not. It was not. And the business except the business community went nuts, and nobody else paid attention to them. You there's. there's Plenty of in ingress and egress out of that mountain house. Nice. If the state used it for a prison, why on earth can't the county because use it? Because you're not transferring prisoners in and out of yeah, other places. Yeah, once they're in, they're in. Once you're looking at you the prison's different your, from a jail. If you move your courts as well, which is what the state was suggesting they do, then you have less of that. No, 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 it's not the courts. It's anymore. the other jails. It's like the Dearborn Jail, well, the lockups down river. They were going to close those anyway, Steve. No, no, no they weren't. They were going to close those to move to the site downtown. Exactly, and they could do the same thing it's at Mount. A lot Harder. The, the, the reason they chose where they were was because that's a lot more accessible place. The reason they chose what where they were it was a it's right across the street sweet, from the current sweetheart jail. contracting and payoffs. That's always and part another, of the deal. Yeah, no, I you know agree. another cronyistic Wayne County mess. So no one has a bid on the property right now. We've got nothing. Well, but see, I also think I also think it's a mistake to to undervalue that property. If you're not going to build a jail there, it's 
pretty prime real it's estate. for something. Cross street from Ford Field, it right is. near Greektown but Casino. We could have something great there. Dollars, Steve. I mean, well, it's not worth that. The Gilbert people figure it's worth between 30 and 60 if they can find other uses for the for the, uh, for the building. Well, and that, it wasn't that's going to be painful for The jail for the site itself wasn't worth the $15 million the county paid for it in the first place, in which um, Charlie Williams got a $400,000 finder. Right, right. but the wow. other I mean, possibility here is, Go ahead, Stephen. Beginning. You know, if you can tear down Frank Murphy and move that out to, to Mound Road mm -hmm. and the old jail, now you're talking about a very big site right on the edge of downtown. Right. You can do something really special. And you got to make sure you got planners in place that are going to make sure that they're using it in the best possible way, right. too. All right, well, let's move on. You know, big decisions out of the Supreme Court this week that impact gay marriage here in Michigan. There is a ban against same-sex marriage, but there are already conversations in Lansing to talk about ending the ban. So what are the conversations, Stephen, that's going on right now? Well, I mean, I think you've got uh, activists uh, uh, on, on certainly the pro-gay marriage side talking about whether uh, they can get a ballot initiative together for 14 or for 16, what, what I understand is that they don't think they'll have the money or the organization to get it on the 14 ballot. Uh, so it, it will probably be 2016. But meanwhile, you have uh, you have two other avenues that, that, that are working. One is uh, the legislature, where there's going to be bills introduced to put it on the ballot, which the legislature can do. Uh, and then you've got this court case in, uh, in Judge Friedman's uh, courtroom in downtown Detroit, where he has said that the central question uh, about uh, this adoption case that, that landed in his court is whether the, the ban on gay marriage is constitutional. And, and I suspect uh, that given what the court's language was like this week, uh, what the rulings look like, he could very, very likely say, this is an unconstitutional uh, infringement of, of people's liberty. And yeah, they could Supreme, change everything the here. Supreme Court ruling would seem to pave the way for that. I would it think did. the remedy would, in Michigan would more likely come in the courts. I don't think this decision in this case is going to legalize gay marriage, but it, it may very well remove that ban because if you look at the way Justice Kennedy wrote that decision, I mean, he did very correctly say uh, marriage law is a matter uh, for the states to determine and for each state to decide. But then he also invoked the e Equal protect Protection Clause. Right. And, you know, it's hard to say, it's hard to see how they're going to tolerate a situation where the federal government discriminates in one state and doesn't discriminate in another state. Um, you know, I think the inconsistency there is going, are going to lead ultimately to um, the change in Michigan. As someone who covered the Supreme Court, Stephen, what were your thoughts this week as you saw everything come down? Well, you know, I mean, you've got Justice Kennedy. This is the third opinion he's written for the court in the last decade uh, that really takes, uh, uh, you know, a broad swipe at efforts to single out uh, gay couples uh, because they are gay. I mean, this, this is something that really offends him personally uh, and really offends his, his notion of, of constitutional liberty. I think uh, there's no question that, that uh, you know, third time uh, is a charm in this case and that it's just going to be very difficult going forward for anybody to, to pass legislation uh, or even constitutional amendments in their states that, that treat gay people differently because they're gay. It's hard to imagine going out, you're going to have a situation where where uh, marriage is legal in some states and not legal in the other states. Yeah. Clearly, the court's not going to allow it to be illegal. Uh, so, I, I mean, it, it's hard not to see this thing coming to uh, a conclusion. Some change here. All right, uh, Senate Republicans say Medicaid expansion in Michigan is not dead, despite the lack of the vote last week. A GOP work group has been formed by Senate Majority Leader Randy Richardville to study it. So has uh, Mr. Richardville and uh, Mr. Snyder, have they, have, they, have they made up a little bit? Well, I don't know if they've made up. Um, Richardville's going to ask for some changes. I think the governor's going to give it. I talked to both of them last week. Um, both of them downplayed uh, their future. The drama. Will, and <laughs> I believe they'll come back sometime in uh, the fall, either in, in August when they return at the start of the session or sometime early on and uh, get this thing done. Uh, they're going to build in some protections that allow the Republicans who are worried about the cost exploding. Uh, they're going to build in some protections, whether they mean anything or not, in the end, uh, to, to allow them to cast votes for it. All right, so there's no vote next week, I think, is what the governor originally Yeah, unfortunately, there, there, there won't be. I mean, you know, this is a loss for the governor, as, in, as I see it. I mean, a, a, it's, a, it's a sign of his inability to control his own caucus. It's also a sign that he's made deals uh, in the past with people who've stabbed him in the back. 
going forward, I think you gotta you gotta treat the whole thing differently. Well, how a, would that's a classical overstatement? Well, this is the political would, process. This is the way politics yeah. works. You've got a strong governor and you've got strong legislative leaders. You're going to have this sort of sort of clashes. But in the end, what will happen here is what always happens. They'll get a compromise deal. You compare that See, with what we went through for eight years. Where we got no well, deal. No one's there. Compromise, no one's, compromise, no compromise no deal. Depends how painful better. it is to each side. Though, no one's right? saying this, that was better. But the reason that Jennifer Granholm couldn't get anything done was because she had opposition. And she was from uh, no, no. Hold on. She she had she never had control of. He's got control of the, the governor's office and both houses of the legislature, and he can't and get you his own be agenda. Encouraged that it's not a rubber stamp. That there Please. is tension. That there is a process. Please. This is this They'll is about somebody done. who this is about somebody They'll who's a not a strong leader. Fall. This is a guy who's not, not well, proven to be a got, strong leader. This guy's got in the more legislature. done in two and a half years than we got done in in he, eight. So he got done what he, they wanted to get done. He's a plenty done. strong leader um, in terms of the as changes soon as he put in place. This is a guy who said Look at stuff what we've was done not here in two right, and, and, years. and the things that he said were not on his agenda. He yeah. let them take control of, and the stuff that he wants and to get all done. All right, and, and, and we shall see his agenda up to this point. I mean, you sat here, and a lot of people said, "Well, gosh, he's not a leader. He can't get a bridge built." Well. Well, and we shall see how, let's the see, bridge? Let's see no how bridge. it all works out in the fall. Gentlemen, have a great weekend. That's going to do it for Me My too. Week. Thanks so much for joining us. Go to myweek.org for any shows that you might have missed. Take care. We'll see you next week. <laughs>